Hey there, sales and cigars fans. Ready to supercharge your marketing strategy? We've got an episode today you don't want to miss. In this power pack conversation I have with Matt Anderson, you'll discover why the traditional demographics-based approach is out and what's taking its place. You'll get the inside scoop on three things you need to know about your audience for a killer marketing strategy. And uh, then we're going to introduce you to a little known marketing research method that outperforms those $50,000 opinion polls and focus groups. Start using it today free and capture the voice of your customer and get your best customers to essentially write your advertising for you. Prepare to attract attention, persuade prospects, and overcome objections like never before. So what are you waiting for? Go grab a cocktail, a cigar, strap into this game-changing episode. You won't regret it. Thanks. So, Matt, I appreciate you taking some more time to come back and, and talk about this, uh, this this series that we've created about how to think about marketing. You know, and we're doing this right for, for entrepreneurs. So, uh, Yeah, thanks for having me back. I'm looking forward to, you know, doing this until we run out of stuff to talk about, which I think might be, uh, might be hard to do. A while. <laughs> so what, what I'd like to do is, is sort of rehash what we talked about last week. Um, I'll, I'll kind of try to summarize it. You fix up what I forgot. Um, but I think there's a big piece that, that we, we want to make sure we get for everybody. And that the responsibility for the story, for the message of what we're trying to accomplish with our marketing is really that founder, entrepreneur, business owner that he or she has to be the one who drives that because they're the one who owns it. Is that, is there anything? Yeah, we need to to that? yeah I think that's, that's one of the frustrating truths that uh, a lot of people, you know, th- 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 I talk to, to clients all the time who are really frustrated by the lack of progress in their marketing. And, you know, almost always, uh, you know, th- there's, lots of marketing people that give bad advice out there. So, you know, there's certainly a role that the marketer plays in marketing that has failed, but almost always when someone's really frustrated with their marketing, I can trace that back to some issues with their core message. Um, So, you know, the, the entrepreneur ultimately sets the table for any marketing engagement. If you ask an ad agency and say, Hey, I need to redo my logo they're probably going to redo your logo. They might ask, you know, if they're good, they might ask you, well, why do you think that? And let's make sure that's true. But almost always you're going to end up with a new logo. Or if you think, hey, I need to spruce up my website to fix my marketing, you're going to get a spruced up website. Um, Whether it will fix your marketing or not, well, that really depends. Is that really the problem? Um, But, you know, almost always when you hire a marketing person or you engage an ad agency, uh, they don't know anything about your business, right? You're the one who's creating the business. You're the one who's deciding who you sell to, what you're going to sell, the problems you're trying to solve. What's your competitive advantage? Why would people want to purchase your product or services? And so, you know, they'll ask you about those things. You'll tell them what you think, and then they'll go off. And their job is to translate what you told them about your message into something that's more creative and more persuasive. So, I mean, I think that's a really good summary of what we were talking about. And, and and I think to really bang the end of that is because I've talked to different marketers at different time in my career, different doing different things. And I, and I think there's a parallel with, you know, uh, a politicians, people going out doing a survey. Yeah. If I ask you a question in a particular fashion, you're going to answer it in a particular fashion. That's right. So, so, you know, bad marketer, good marketer, I'm not looking to put the label on somebody, but if what they're saying or what they're asking, we're, we're assuming as the business owner, the entrepreneur, that they know what they're doing and we can just follow their lead. And I think one, that's a mistake yes. that we really have to dig in to what it is that we're trying to accomplish with whom, why, or what that whole, that whole piece that we'll get into down the road. Um, so I, I think that, that that's really important. We just can't trust them because they're an agency of whatever stature. Um, so, and, and I think the way to think about that, it, it ties it back to what we talked about, you know, 
that's our responsibility as the entrepreneur. And we have to be able to say, no, 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 that's, that's, that's not really right. Um, it, and, and it has to do with the four types of entrepreneurs. So if you could hit those and kind of like, we don't need to get into the deets on it, but they can go back and listen to the last, last month's episode. But that plays into how they should think about the rest of the marketing story, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so I, I think there's very much uh, kind of a garbage in, garbage out scenario here, right? If you give poor input, or if what you think about the kind of core elements of your message is wrong, it doesn't matter how good your marketer is, the advertising that's created isn't gonna work. So like I've worked for agencies that have really talented creatives who do extraordinary work. And each one of these agencies has produced projects that you know generated millions and millions and millions of dollars in sales, changed people's lives and all the rest. Um, but each of those agencies also produced work that landed with a thud. And if I look it's back at the big market, the Pinto and the Etzel, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. When I look at it, look back at what was the difference, almost always it was whether the input we received from the client was on target or not. It wasn't how creative the people doing the advertising was. It was the same people doing the good advertising or the bad advertising. It was how good the input was. And I think that really explains what we're talking about. We got to, it's our, we got to own that input. And if it, if it doesn't resonate, we got to sit with it, got to marinate it. And that's what I'm hoping that we help, you know, with these, with these conversations that right. we were able to help them think that, oh, we got to, we got to really dig into this a little bit deeper. Yeah. It, well, and so to, to make it even more challenging, the common thread in each of those situations, I guarantee you all of the clients thought they were giving good input. All of the clients thought they had the right message and it was just, you know, we just need to make it sparkle. Right. Um, but what I've, you know, through 20, 25 years of doing this in my career, uh, I've noticed a theme that what makes entrepreneurs good at business often causes them to be bad at figuring out what their message really needs to be. Right. You know, tell, me more, tell me more about that. Cause that, that's, so that's sort of the four problem. types of entrepreneurs we talked about, right? There are innovators who come up with solutions that the market really needs. They're right about the problem and they have a good solution to it, but they're so far ahead of everyone that they spend their time trying to convince the customer that they need what they've created, right? Rather than selling them what the customer already wants. And almost always you need to start with what the customer wants and then figure out a way to sell them what they need. Right. Right. So that's the problem of the innovator. Then there's the entrepreneur who's the imitator. You know, they're not a professional marketer, but they've read a few marketing books and the marketing books are persuasive. And so they, they come up and they hire an agency and says, I want you to, you know, provide something that's uh, concrete and uh, unusual, right? Well, that's taken from made to stick. Well, okay, you know, if your marketers can't do that, they're, you know, you probably got the wrong people, but that doesn't tell you what needs to be created, right? That doesn't you know, that doesn't help you figure out your message. That just, you know, gives you some ideas on a filter of whether they did a good job at the end of the day or not. Right. Um, and so, you know, imitators, you know, instead of focusing, you know, what you want to do is you want to create a message that other people want to imitate. You know, if you're just trying to imitate stuff that worked for other businesses, almost always it's not going to work for you and yours. Um, you know, and then there's the tacticians, you know, who, you know, they sat at the country club and, you know, uh, the customer data platforms are the latest thing or, you know, so I, I need to get a CDP or, you know, uh, I know I need a website, so I'm going to hire someone to do that. Um, and, you know, tactics are great. You know, you probably do need a website these days. But what matters, what's going to move the needle is what your website says, not whether you have one or not. Exactly. Um, you know, and then, you know, and then, then the uh, last category uh, is escaping my mind uh, right now. Uh, the, the, the last category of the, uh, the optimizer people. Oh yeah. The optimizers. Those are the people who are really frustrated by how inefficient marketing is. You know, they know, you know, knowing that 98% of the people who see their ads aren't ever going to buy. It's like, Hey, they're really good at operations and they've got an engineering mindset. And so they think they know exactly who to talk to, when to talk to them and how to talk to them. And they end up with marketing that doesn't reach far enough. Um, and too they narrow to focus. Yeah. And they end up with a customer profile that's too narrow. And so their message is 
you know, optimized before it even attracts attention. Um, and so they focus on what's going to close the sale and they forget all the things that they need to do to attract the right people in the first place. Right. So each one of them has a strength and a weakness or both yes. plural each. Um, and we need to overcome that as a, as a business and entrepreneur. And I, I would think, I think that we, we lean in that direction, right? One of those things is our dominant, but there's a little bit of all of that in each of us who's gone out to try to create a company. And so all of those buckets were all of those things. It's just that one of them were, was, is sort of the lead, um, lead scenario. So I, I think we've like, if you're the entrepreneur, you got to overcome these issues. You got to, you got to, um, you don't can't just narrow, uh, just trust the marketing person because they've done marketing before. Doesn't matter. It's our responsibility to give them the right data, the right input, the right answers, um, and really be clear about that alignment. So right. your marketers need you to tell them who they're marketing to, what they're selling, and why it matters why you know the the why of your business you know why does it matter why does it matter to the customer what are your values what's going to really captivate them and build that relationship uh and then you know how how are you selling it you know what are your offers how are you distributing it what is the sales process what does the what do you need the customer to do you know unless you have those pillars of the message really clear your marketers are going to spin the spin their wheels yeah and you're going to piss away money exactly so all right, I, I think we nailed the, the summary, and I think if we missed it the first time, we hit it here. But I would go back and listen to that, that previous episode. Um, so who is the who of, who, of, 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 the, of the story we're trying to create? Um, I, think, I think some people call the ICP or the ideal client profile, the persona or um, uh, avatar. Yeah, your ideal client, your customer profile, you know, there's, it goes by a lot of a lot of names. But it's all the same in, 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 a, in a sense. It's just the context of how that marketing person thinks about it. So it's still the who. So I, I, I'm, I'm really interested in this because I think this can really get us off track quickly yeah. if we're not clear about it. And the other thing that I'm, I'm looking forward to is that um, that that how later when we, yeah. you know, a couple of months down the road, but, but so let's talk about the who, and I don't think we're going to get through it today, but um, I'm going to let you sort of guide this, like that beginning part of what, what a, a business owner entrepreneur needs to start to pull together before they even think about calling the market. Right. right. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think, it wouldn't, it won't surprise you, uh, you know, based on the conversations we've had, it may not surprise our listeners anymore, uh, that I have a somewhat different take on what you need to know about the who in order to be an effective marketer. Um, you know, I'm sure you took a marketing class in, in school, you've read marketing books, uh, you've definitely taken sales classes. You know, what is it that, you know, people tend to center on when they think about you know, okay, I need to define my audience. Well, they're, they're thinking about like where they are, who they are, what, what do they do? Where, what, what do they like? What do they dislike? How do I, how do I relate to them? Um, I've made all of those mistakes, but I think, I think you're what I have a little insight because yeah. we've talked in the past. I know where you're going to go. And I think this is part of the the reason why I wanted to do this with you is because you're flipping everything around. So just, yeah. Just so, yeah. So, so, you know, traditional marketing and sales thought says we need to define who the audience is, which is absolutely right. But the way we tend to do it traditionally is by using demographic information, you know, geography, where are they located? Age, sex, income, uh, you know, job title, industry, you know, all of those things. And yeah, those, those things are important. There's a good reason that's common practice. Uh, it used to be that the only way you could get in front of an audience, uh, because remember, all that marketing is, is getting in front of an audience and then putting a message there, right? 
uh, you know, you want to make sure you're in front of the right people and you want to make sure you're saying the right thing. Well, to, you know, it used to be the hardest thing to do in marketing was to get in front of an audience. Uh, and so you would use demographic information. You would go out to publications or TV stations or radio stations. You would get what's called a rate card. And that rate card would include their demographic study. They surveyed their listeners or their readers, and they figured out that, you know, 80% of them are men and 25% uh, of them make up more than $150,000 a year. And, you know, 50% of them are married and they tend to be congregated in the Northeast, right? And based on that information, you can say, you know what, I think there's a good chance that enough of my customers are in that audience that an ad, placing an ad in this magazine or running an ad on this TV show is going to be worth what it costs me. And, okay. you know, then what happened is when they said, okay, we're going to allocate our budget for this year to these publications and these channels, uh, then they would go, they would talk to their ad agency and they would say, we need these ads to be created, right? And so in other words, traditional media thinking, traditional sales thinking is almost always demographics first, and then we're going to infer whatever we need to psychographically from the demographics. And then using that information, we're going to create our advertisement. Um, and that, that worked when you could only buy media in a few limited places and there wasn't that much media you could buy, right? That was all you needed to do. And it, it led to a very much lowest common denominator type of thinking. That's why you got these big brands that cater to 80% of the market. Tide became the largest detergent because it promised to make your clothes clean, right? Uh, and do so in a color safe way. It was better than bleach. Um, but, you know, it's very simple, very lowest common denominator, denominator message. Today, uh, we have a lot more options. And so what I think is strategy, marketing strategy, rather than spending 95% of your time on budget allocation and tactic selection, you need to spend 90% of your time on the message. And once you figure out what the right message is, it's really easy to get it in front of the right people. Uh, you could do it through all these digital platforms. You can do it just in a wide variety of methods. Yeah, and you can go that. I mean, one of the things you said to me in the past is that that's the easy part. Yes. It's like go finding the people. But if you if you don't know what that message is and you don't know who those people really are, you, whatever the words you throw at them, they're just going to go in one ear and out the other or not resonate or not not be there. So Yeah, I mean, if you have 100 bucks on a credit card, you can get in front of 10,000 of your ideal customers just by going to Facebook or Google or Instagram or whatever, TikTok. Right. Um, that's, not, that's not the hard thing. Um, but what it means is that because it's so easy to get in front of the audience, everyone else is getting in front of your, your, your ideal customer too, right? What so there's so much noise, you know, I, I, the latest study I saw said, we see an average of 10,000 commercial messages a day, you know, in the form of billboards and logos and ads, uh, on, on, you know, every website we visit and, you know, ads are everywhere. How are you going to cut through and what are you going to say that grabs your customer's attention, persuades them to be interested and closes the sale? That's going to determine whether you succeed or not. So All how do we do that? Message. That's the magic. Is there, you got a wand? Like, how do we do that? <laughs> well, so we, we said that, you know, our, our instincts as entrepreneurs often work against us. So what I'm hoping we can do in this, this episode and the next ones as we unpack the kind of the core, those core elements of your message is to kind of give you a roadmap to what you need to know about your customer, what you need to know about your solution, what you need to know about your offer in order to create that kind of message that cuts through the noise and, and actually moves the needle. So to, you know, we'll start with the who, right? And yeah, you, yeah, you need to kind of know your demographics, right? That's certainly a place to start, but, if you're spending more than four, five minutes on that and you don't know that already, you're 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 spending too much time in the wrong areas. So people in my space in my world, yes, I want to talk to. I mean, we can we can shorten and widen the list of people, but I I want to speak to a business owner. Yep. Who's frustrated? I mean, I, I literally want him frustrated with the same results 
of from their sales team. And now I can go different ways with that. Right. Right. And I could have an offer that went this way and I could have an offer that went that way, but that isn't sufficient. Correct. That's right. But that's where a lot of us think we're done. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, what, what I like to do with clients is, you know, we'll get that just kind of rough customer profile, right. You know, just rough demographics, but I'm going to spend 90% of my time with them on the audience, uh, trying to discover and really create a, a, an in-depth almost architecture of what that ideal customer's psychology is. What are the things in the audience that make them an ideal customer? And then what's going to drive them? You know, what are the hooks that we can use to grab their attention and then begin to persuade them? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about hooks. And so if I peel back my onion and start to think about my, my guys. Yeah. It's probably a guy. Right. And not because I don't like women. I think there's women are smarter in a lot of ways than us um, when it comes to running an organization. But a guy who um, is not overly emotional, but like like cigars, has no problem being direct and blunt. um, That isn't offended easily. Yeah. that probably like I could go down that path. Is that not, am I making it too narrow or is it, is that, is that the wrong direction? I I think you're looking at the wrong things. Okay. So, you know, where you started, it's probably a guy, right? Well, you know, it may be that 80% of your customers are men, but they're probably your customers for a different reason than the fact that they're a man, right? Is there anything intrinsically about being a man that makes them a more ideal customer for you? Well, Probably not. If you had if you had a magic wand, you would probably say, "Well, no, my ideal customer starts off uh, more in the psychology than their age or gender." Growth minded is that more? Yeah, growth minded right? might be a place to start. Okay. Um, you know, so so and and I mean, like I could give you an example. Uh, you know, Callaway Golf, right? They make high-end drivers. Uh, And, you know, so traditionally, if we took a demographics first mindset, they'd say, well, this is someone who is, uh, you know, probably male, probably makes more than $150,000 a year, probably middle-aged, 30 to 50, uh, maybe, uh, you know, maybe retired. Um, You know, they uh, uh, are members of country club. Uh, they, you know, have played golf and they like to, you know, and they want to improve their game. Right. And with that information, we could find a number of magazines to advertise in. Um, but today, you know, when you go to these digital platforms, they have 10,000 variables on everyone. Right. Probably, you know, it's easier. It's, it's more productive to target someone by behavior. It turns out for Callaway, someone who has, uh, spent half of their time online at, at golf websites for the last 30 days is probably their ideal customer, right? If they, you know, if they purchase golf balls every month from their credit card information, because they're, probably of urgency be, and- they're probably more likely to be the ideal customer than someone who makes $150,000 a year and is a 50 year old male. Because of the urgency, because of that, they're already in, they're doing some, because their behavior and their mindset is a better indication that they're likely to be a customer than just the mere facts about who they are. Interesting. Right. So if you tell me you're, you're a CEO, odds are you play golf sometimes, right? That's a, an indicator. But if you buy golf balls every week, I know you play golf, right? We can gather that information as marketers. Yeah, that information is available in the interest audiences, you know, the, the, the Facebook and Google sell it to you in the form of interest audiences. They collect all that information and then they create audiences based on it. All right. So, that also tells you more about what you need to say, what you're interested in, and your preoccupations psychologically are where your message comes from. So, if you want to get the right message, you need to know what makes your customer tick. 
And it's a lot easier to start with that information rather than try to infer that from, you know, some sort of demographic profile of who your customer is. So if I can sort of summarize what you, you're saying is that the traditional approach, whether it's the 1950s or the 2020s, is asked backwards. Yeah. About going after that that information that is interesting, probably part of the whole thing. But we want to be looking more at the the the, the psychographics, the behaviors, how they how, what they're doing. Is that yep. part of the behaviors, right? What they're doing right now. That's, that's part of the behaviors. Um, so you know, I I you know I I went through a facilitation process with you several years ago. So I know you know a lot about your customer, right? If I if I ask you certain questions, you're going to give me a lot of good information. Um, and and this is where I think if we we could really help the audience is by helping them understand what really moves the needle about their audience when it comes to you know creating marketing that works. You know how do you arrive at that message that's going to cut through the cl- clutter and move the needle? Well, it turns out there are three kind of core things that you need to know about your audience. And if you can give your marketing team these three things, they're going to be, you know, so much far, further along than where you start. Even the crappy marketers, if you give them the right information, can be more on point. Yeah. I mean, there are, let, let's say that 50% of marketers don't know enough about how to persuade people to use that information, even if you have it. But if you have someone who's of average skill or better, getting these parts right, they may not come up with the most creative solution. They may not come up with the most persuasive wording. They might not even recommend all the right tactics. But I can guarantee you, if you have these three things right and it shows up in your message, you're going to be so much further along than most of your competitors when it comes to attracting the attention you need and persuading the people you attract to buy. Okay. Let's, so we, we can talk about these three and then wrap it up and come back and talk about them in our next episode. Yeah, so I, think that's, I think that's a good idea. Let's, 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 talk about what those, let's talk about what those things are. And then next time we can talk about how they ought to influence your message. Awesome. Cool. Well, so let's start at the beginning. And for me, that's always the customer's problems or pains. What is it that makes them an ideal customer for your product or service? Well, almost always they have some sort of problem or something or some frustration that you provide the solution to. Yep. And so you need to provide, you need to know what are the core problems that drive someone to be interested in the kind of solution you provide and which problems of all the ones that might drive interest are the ones that are most important to ultimately making them the ideal customer for you. So if if there's five of them, if they have five big problems, yes, then we still need to go back and prioritize those. Yes. But I wouldn't worry too much about prioritization before you make sure that you understand what those problems are and that you truly understand how those problems present themselves for your customer. So kind of the first step is, okay, let's identify all the possible problems. And here, you know, uh, what I would say is a lot of people make their list too short. Okay. Because, so let's say you're an accountant, Um, you know, what problems do you solve? Well, I have people who need to get their taxes done. And I have people who need to make sure their books are in order. And then they might stop there. Right? Blah, blah, blah. Boring. Yeah. Well, okay. You know, we probably need to expand that list. You know, they may, you know, they may not know, am I as profitable as I should be? Uh, You know, at the end of the day, you know, uh, how do I keep track of my costs? Right? Do they have a cost issue? Am I paying too much in taxes? Right. Am I paying too much in taxes? Uh, Is my uh, corporation structured in the right way? Uh, You know, uh, what about payroll? 
Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of other things that might drive them to say, you know, I don't know if my accounting firm is doing a good job. I might need a new one. Right. Yeah, you get, you get, those are the things that are getting this prospect, this, this dot, this I, I, uh, ideal client to be thinking about their problems differently to be this, this is making me kind of churn a little bit. Is that, is that yeah. part of this? So the, the angst that a problem creates, you know, it, 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 people almost, you know, there's a, uh, Inertia isn't just a law in physics, right? It's also a law in marketing and sales. You know, people have a tendency to keep doing what they're doing unless they have a really good reason to motivate them to do something different. Status quo, baby. So yeah. Big, and so big, the big. problems and pains you're looking for, are what are those frustrations? What are the emotional, what are the issues that are, are generating enough emotional energy that it might actually get them to look at something different? And then if they look at something different, you know, end up doing something different and buying the solution you're offering. All right. So that's one we can still dive into more. What's the second? Well, the second is uh, what are their unmet desires, unrealized desires? What are the goals that they want to achieve? Right. So if the pains and pains and problems are the negative emotions that might motivate them, the desires or the goals are the positive emotions. You know, what is it that they're working to achieve? Who do they hope to be in the future? You know, what, uh, you know, if they could wave a magic wand, how would they change their life to make it better? So it's, it's, it's the positive spin on the negative things, but we're talking to the same people that resonate with them. Right? Exactly. So it might be the flip side, you know, it, it, you know, it, my problem might be that I don't have enough leads, right? But my own desire may be, I want to be financially secure. Okay, that makes sense. So you could speak to bo- to either or both, right? Um, or, but, or or both of them in different ways at different times, right? Exactly, exactly. And our 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 third key core element. Yeah, our third key core element in building out kind of the psychological architecture of our customer is what do they believe about the world? And when we mine our customers' beliefs. We're looking for two things. A, what's true that they already believe that relates to, you know, uh, what we're trying to sell, right? Because if if you reinforce what they already believe and you show how what they believe means they ought to be your customer, well, that's a pretty persuasive way to, to move the needle, right? And we tend to like to read about things that reinforce things that we already believe. Sure. Uh, and then the second category, and the one that's even maybe more explosive and powerful, is what does the, what, what does the customer believe that's false? What false beliefs do you need to dislodge that, if you change their mind, make them an ideal customer for you? And these have to be impactful beliefs that are going to challenge if on, on the on the false beliefs they're going to challenge this person's. Um, thought process, their belief. And we have to be able to back that up as we as we progress down the marketing messaging, right? Right. So for example, for you, a common belief might be, well, if my sales team is, isn't performing, I have the wrong salespeople, right? Well, yeah, that, that might be true, but be. in your world and in mine, you know, in my experience, you can't hire your way out of a sales or marketing problem 99% of the time. 99% of the time, you probably have a sales process and you probably have a messaging problem. Well, and you're, 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 you're hundred percent right. Uh, because as a business owner, from a sales perspective, we're relying on that salesperson right. to go tell the right story because we didn't give it to them. Right. Exactly. And that's how this whole loop comes back around. And, and one of the things that we, as you were describing the core elements here, you can't do a consultative sell in a complex B2B sale, right? I'm, I'm getting specific. Right. You can't do really good discovery and ask those questions of that prospect without this. Right. Because you're, you're, you want to understand how this person's thinking. You want to understand what their beliefs are. 
if you don't have this information lined up, your salespeople can't win because they don't, most of them, you know, when I say most, I mean, 94% of them have no idea how to do this. Another, right. another group can figure it out if you give it to them. And then a lot more can help. Another 20% can, if you coach them up well and help, help them do it. But if they don't have this, it's, it's not a people problem. So the, the alignment between marketing messaging and sales questions and discovery processes and, and sales process, they're, they're, they're intertwined like a rope. Right. And so if you have a business owner who is thinking, you know what, I just hired the wrong person. Let me hire someone else. And the new salesperson is going to succeed where the old salesperson failed. You know, that's a category of false belief that, you know, they're probably sticking their head in the sand, right? They believe that because it's convenient and it means they don't have to figure out what's wrong in their business to solve the problem, right? The, so the, the so truth if is that it, if we're building out that customer profile, we need to know that that's what they believe if we're going to market effectively, right? At some point, we need to challenge that belief to get them interested in the solution we're offering. You know, in the marketing, we need to challenge it. And then in the sales process, we need to come back to that and, and dig into that as well and talk about that. Ask those questions yeah. and challenge it. I, I mean, so I, you're starting to see how that customer profile then directly impacts what's said in your marketing. And it directly impacts what's said in your sales process. So, and if you don't know those things about your customer, you know, you don't know what their problems are. You don't know what pains they have. You don't know what their unmet desires are. You don't know how they see the world, what they believe, you know, both true and false that's related to your sale. Odds of you, <coughs> excuse me, I hearing a marketer to then go and create ads that are going to, sell your products and services are almost nil, right? So, that's, no, that's it, it's, it's, it's almost impossible unless you dumb luck step in a pile of shit that's the, the right pile. Right. Um, and, and remember, your marketers and your salespeople, generally, they're not experts in your industry. They're not experts in your business, right? They don't have the answer. If they did, they'd be an entrepreneur hmm. because that's a lot more lucrative and a lot more fun. Than doing no, some, some days it's more fun. Some days it's not so fun. Yeah, um, true. So I, I, I'm, I'm super excited here, and I hope the audience sees that you know you've shined a light on the the three areas that, with some help and some, some thinking, that they can come to this party or, it's not a party. It, it's what you do as a facilitation. Yeah, of pulling this out. Because it's in there. It's in that business owner. It's in that entrepreneur's brain. It's in their, it's probably in their DNA. Yeah. That they have all of this there. And then you need to massage it and pull it out and play with it a little bit and get them to think about it differently. Yeah. Um, and we're probably going to push back on some of it. But I, 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 I'm excited about diving into these these conversations. But I think just, just this summary today um, is going to change how a business owner thinks about marketing and, and how they're going to approach it. Like before they go create the website, before they go hire uh, another agency, before they go create more ads, I got to go do the work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe to wrap up, um, we can even give our listeners a little bit of homework. Uh, okay. so I think you're right. That And in my experience, I do facilitation with people, right? I, uh, you know, to your point earlier, you know, it, market research, the answers you get depend on the questions you ask. Um, I have a way of asking different questions than most marketers do that pull out what you already know about your customer and about your product in a way that puts it in a shape that's much more conducive to marketing. Right. So my experience is what you just said. A lot of the people that I talk to as clients know a lot of the right answers. The problem is they've it's never been documented anywhere. Right. Right. No one has, you know, they might have a description of the demographics of their customer, but they don't have an accurate psychological profile that their sales teams and their marketers can use to 
really do their jobs. Oh, and this. without that, you know, you, you're, you, I, I can guarantee, you know, at least 50% of the market, the money you're spending on marketing and sales salaries is being wasted. So you know, I'll say this as we wrap up. I think that if somebody heard something here again, that like, you know, they, they should be excited if they're trying to fix their marketing that, um, you know, we're going to talk about this and we're going to give this kind of information and going to help them go through yeah. this, but they want to, if they want to expedite this process, um, they can just call Matt. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, well, that's the easy answer, right? Just give me a call. Uh, you can find me on uh, Zegio Marketing Solutions, which is Z-E-G-G dot I-O, which is online. Uh, and uh, we can schedule a, a free consultation and, you know, figure out if uh, this is the right solution for you. Um, but, you know, even separately with the information that we've given you already just in this first episode on, on the audience, uh, I would challenge you to start to build out that, you know, customer profile. What are all the pains or problems that might cause someone to be interested in your solution? What do your customers dream about? What outcomes do they want? What are their unmet desires, uh, you know, related to what you sell? And then and don't stop short. Just no. Go, just yeah. fill the page, right? Yeah, I start with a list of at least 10 problems. Uh, and you might find that you're able to condense them down to five. Uh, but, you know, if all you can think of is two or three things, uh, odds are you don't really understand your customer the way you need to in order to create the interest that uh, is, you know, that, that, that your marketing needs to, needs to generate. Uh, and so if after doing this exercise, you figure out, you know, I may not know my customer as well as I need to. Um, researching your customers is really easy today. You know, instead of doing a market survey, although, you know, there's there's a time and a place for that. Um, you know, I would go and I would look at what are what do customers say when they review books about what you do uh, on Amazon? So I was working with a client that uh, has a guitar school um, and, uh, you know, they were trying to describe uh, what their customers were interested in. Um, you know, and they, they knew their customers okay, right? But they knew it from the perspective of a, of a guitar teacher who has spent 20 years teaching guitar and has a whole bunch of theories and ideas about what guitar students want. Uh, it turns out when you look at how people review uh, books about learning how, the, the guitar, the customers end up using very different language, right? Important. Yeah. So, you know, as the entrepreneur, you've often forgotten what it's like to be the customer. Uh, and so you want to get the actual voice of the customer. What, what words do they actually use? How are they actually thinking? So like, you know, I said, look at reviews on Amazon. Look at the questions they ask on Q&A forums like Reddit and Quora. And, you know, what do they say? What advice are they looking for? Um, you know, there's there's all sorts of those kinds of things. Another really good source is look at your competitors' online reviews and Ooh. see what the customers praise, right? That's usually a clue to what they want. And then see what they criticize. That's usually a clue to the frustrations they have. And, you know, see if you can infer why did they hire them in the first place? What problem were they trying to solve? That's all a great problems. idea. That's a really, like, you know, trying to understand and deconstruct, um, you know, and getting the right language and the right, the right, uh, angle to, to, to see your business from their perspective. And then that allows you to, uh, it's hard to do because you're immersed in it, right? We're, we're, we're living it every day and we may, most of us have been doing it a long time and we have a bit of a, a perspective that can sometimes be cloudy. Yeah. I can tell you though, like if I can just urge your, your audience to do that homework. And even if you think you have a really good understanding of your customer, I would recommend doing the sort of research that, you know, I just described. I can't tell you how often the breakthrough phrase for an advertising campaign that went on to gross millions of dollars came directly from a customer review or a customer testimonial or, you know, some sort of uh, review online of like a book or a movie that's related to the subject. And the customer just had the magic phrase, right? It's and, there. And, and that those gold nuggets will jump out at you 
uh, if you if you even spend an hour or two doing that kind of work. It, it is amazing how often you can improve your marketing just by doing a little bit of that research. So instead of flipping and scrolling through some dumbass feed on on Facebook or some other social media, go do a little work on on, on online that's going to inform your messaging. It's going to help you turn those words into dollars if you totally totally so if if the audience will do that work then i think next time what we can do is we can talk a little bit more about let's actually build out that psychological profile and then show and talk about how you start to reverse engineer what you need to say or what your marketing needs to do from that so i know what my sunday afternoon is going to be with a cigar and a cocktail and, and sitting in front of the computer doing some research on because it you know I'm, I'm an asshole so yeah if i could if i could glean that from a competitor's website totally right, that is so satisfying but that's yeah just, that's or, or for you too i i you know look at all the sales books on amazon or at least you know the best sellers and then just spend 45 minutes scrolling through customer reviews yeah. i think you're going to be shocked that at, at some of the language customers that, that tip right there dude is is gold um totally. i mean and it's you worth the, market research for 50 grand to find it for you yeah and and that's what i that's what i i really want to accomplish i mean you dropped a bunch of nuggets here but i, I really love that you know that here's a thing that you can go do that'll make a difference in your world um we're giving we're, we're giving that we're giving that out so i love it matt until next time enjoy the heat in austin will um, do um and behave yourself thank you Yeah, no, thanks a lot, Walter, and uh, I look forward to the next conversation. Awesome. Me too.